English. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I wish you all a very happy Women's Day. I am Anshula Mehta, Assistant Director at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. And on behalf of the IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center, I welcome you all to this distinguished lecture on the occasion of International Women's Day 2021, uh, being delivered by Professor Govind Kilkar on the role of policy and society in accelerating inclusive equality, um, choosing to challenge for action and impact. Uh, and with that, I invite our moderator for today, Dr. Sameen Hitha, to take forward the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Anshula. And I also uh, wish, I take this opportunity to wish all of you a very happy International Women's Day. And as we choose to challenge, it is my privilege to introduce to you the chair for the session today, Dr. Nivedita Haran, uh, who retired as the additional chief secretary, Department of Home Affairs, Government of Kerala. She holds a PhD in sociology from the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. She also serves as the honorary chairperson on the board of directors of the Center for Migration and Inclusive Development. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Um, uh, may I ha now have your uh, permission to introduce uh, uh, Professor Govind Kelkar? Please, please go ahead. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Professor Govind Kelkar to all of you. Uh, she is the executive director of the GenDev Center for Research and Innovation at Gurugram and chairperson of the Gender Impact Studies Center at Impact and Policy Research Institute. He has extensively worked on gender relations in rural Asia. She has contributed numerous articles to scholarly journals and written over 16 books with a focus on political economy of land, land rights, gender and energy in Asia and has been in close touch with women's movements in the region. Professor Kelkar holds a PhD in political economy of China and is a visiting scholar, visiting professor at the Council for Social Development, Delhi. Concurrently, she is also a, a regional council member of Asia Pacific Forum of uh, Women, Law and Development, Thailand, adjunct distinguished professor of uh, Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, honorary professor at the Yunnan Academy of Social Sciences, China, member of steering committee of BRICS Feminist Watch and visiting fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies, Delhi. Earlier, she was a senior advisor to Landesa in Seattle, USA, and um, international research coordinator of Energia International, the Netherlands, and was also senior advisor at UN Women South Asia office in New Delhi, India. Thank you very much, ma'am, for being with us today, despite your hectic schedule. I invite Dr. Nivedita to uh, provide her opening remarks and thereafter invite Professor Kelkar for her lecture. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Sibi. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be uh, chairing the session, but I have to admit right at the outset that I'm the imposter here. All of you are extremely erudite scholars, uh, faculty members, uh, researchers. I cannot claim to be that. But what I can claim to be is that I have worked in the field and I have grown from the field and I have been involved in policy making and administration all my life. And I continue to be so. So it's indeed an honor that today on the 8th of March, we are getting together to discuss and listen to Professor Kelkar's views on the subject of the role of policy and society in accelerating inclusive equality. Uh, one has to say that uh, it's often uh, said that there is no point celebrating a single day as Women's Day. And it is true, I believe that. So I wish you all a happy Women's Day for all 365 days of the year. And I hope after listening to Professor Kelker's lecture and to the discussions, we will come up with some policy, some uh, actual uh, changes that we can recommend to the government, we can recommend to the other authorities, all the other stakeholders, so that we can bring about a change. I think that is what we need. And I don't want to take your time right now, but probably at the end of it, I will mention uh, how what we need is not just, even within the bureaucracy, what we need is not just ensuring that a policy, uh, every policy is looked at from a gen gender sensitive angle, 
but what we also need is to ensure that even our training, our education system, our research, everything takes care of making our students and the people involved in it sensitive towards uh, gender related issues. And that is something I will hopefully get a chance later to give a few examples from my experience. But right now, I don't want to keep you from the important lecture today, which is by Professor Kelkar. So I welcome Dr. Uh, Professor Govind Kelkar for giving her lecture. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, so much. And I really like uh, your kind of promise that, uh, and we will hold you to that, that you will include some of our kind of uh, recommendations in action, because whatever we are doing as researchers, we really look forward to be implemented in the policies and laws where they become effective. Uh, I once again extend my greetings on this very important day, International uh, Women's uh, Day. Uh, well, you are muted. Uh, no, we lost your voice. Suddenly lost your voice. Oh, okay. oh no, no, no. Now it's, it's fine. Okay. Now it's okay. Yes. Yeah. So I extend my greetings and I hold uh, chairperson to uh, to her promise. That's what I said in a very nice words. But now for a shortage of time, I am summing it up like this. So once again, kind of thing, I, I will share my presentations and probably our presentation and a flowery presentation, more kind of thing, but some kind of um, uh, analysis of that what has been happening with regard to the land question and how an inclusive society can be developed by giving economic justice to women. That would be my theory uh, today. So what do I mean? Can we go to the second immediately? Okay, so what is the state of uh, women's kind of thing? And I define that generally, I'm talking of here, what kind of women I'm talking, I'm talking of women, rural women who are engaged in agriculture hmm? and like, small holders. That is, the, that is the area that we are talking about. So that is the universe that I'm talking about. So there is a discrimination against women in a kind of a vertical level and horizontal level. And vertical level is, re uh, horizontal level is really that these two are thing in policy, law, communication, clan, leadership, that is the vertical. And horizontal is among women and men in different social groups and in throughout the system, in the families and communities and the state structures and the market structures. So, so that is the, these are the two kinds of levels where women are denied rights to resources and capabilities and i'll come in a little while on economic justice what do i mean and there also there entails multiple forms of unfreedoms of women in the on the basis of their sex and gender women's dependency on men which is both in policy and in our social norms which causes vulnerability lack of right to decision making limit to women's mobility Parda system in different forms, but North India is very much gripped in the Parda system uh, in terms of not allowing women. Parda, I mean, not only physical aspect of the Parda, but the system of Parda. And gender-based violence, disallowing any transgression of norms laid down for women, including going out of house in the when it is not considered safe in terms of that is the uh, after eight o'clock or after uh, when it gets dark. So these are the how how the unfreedoms are really women are gripped into. Indian state is, what is the policy commitment? Indian state is a signatory of sustainable development goals, which include women's ownership to land in three goals. Poverty reduction, you cannot achieve poverty reduction without giving land rights to women. Food security, you cannot achieve that without women have the land, agricultural lands in their name. And then women's economic empowerment, uh, that is the uh, goal five, and let's talk about. <coughs> Besides that, it has its own laws on which I will come later. Next one. Next slide, please. Okay, maybe I share my own. Huh? Next slide, Arjun. Conceptualizing Sorry. economic justice. Okay. This, this, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't. It came late. So, what? How do I look at the economic justice? 
uh, I, I define more in following Amartya Sen's thesis of justice, capabilities, both basic and advanced capabilities, economic justice for a dignified human life. So if a person has a dignified human life, and I talked all those kind of unfreedoms, which really uh, are, do not provide that kind of dignity. These capabilities are nurtured by equality and ownership and control over productive assets and freedom from violence and private and public spaces. So this is the this is one part of the conceptualization of the economic justice. Then we so this is the economic justice which good economic plus kind of thing. The primacy of economic justice is carried out through legal measures and implemented policies and also by social groups, social norms at individual level, at collective level. So there are two things, two spheres where this kind of capabilities can produce or economic justice can operate. One is in the legal matters, uh, which is laws and policies, and other is the social norms. So they are protected. These capabilities are protected, reinforced, or changed by state legal measures and social groups. When the communities or social groups, family, community, the state and the market, they stop, they stop, uh, uh, not stop, or they believe in, uh, in these, uh, in these freedoms and they start giving the freedom. They, I wanted to say they stop uh, kind of uh, with this kind of structure of the unfreedoms. The problem of economic justice is linked to the explicit and implicit forms of discrimination within family and household and exploitation in spheres of production and social reproduction. Forms of implicit forms of discrimination in terms of food, education, these are the basic kind of capabilities eh? in the provision of the treatment, how the women are reared and how, how a girl is reared in the family and how a boy is reared. There is a kind of distinct difference. And the latter is recognition of the work, both in production and reproduction. We are in the age of where care economy is so much discussed and care work has not been taken account by the economist and so far and that's why declining participation rate of women is being so much talked about. But you look at the kind of feminist analysis and they say women are overworked. So that means the work is not recognized. That, uh, that is another kind of implicit explicit form of the discrimination. Next one please, at the state level. Next, please. There is a close link between economic justice and gender equality. So next person who, who I am very much in favor of this uh, kind of in conceptualizing, uh, economic, uh, conceptualizing economic justice for women is Nancy Fraser's theory of justice. She takes three dimensions of uh, justice, and I call them later economic justice, redistribution. The, Three, the first dimension is redistribution, is to free individuals or groups from the subordinate status of social culture as well as endow all social members with equal cultural status and identity. Now, do women have identity, equal identity in the cultural status? No, they are in the within the head of the household system. That is not really, except they have political identity as the, as the voters or as citizens but they don't have economic rights. They are not farmers. Even then they are cultivating the land and so much engaged in that. Then second is the recognition, concerns the state power and decision to rule. Do they? Since 1996, uh, the, um, the bill for reservation in the parliament has been lying and it has not so look at the fear of the women's kind of power or or the imposition of the discrimination on women representation of common people rather than political elites which provide new perspective to solve the problem of the global justice system so representation is really of the common people rather than the political we are not talking of political elites so, in fact, a state talks to the two people at the same time. It talks to the, when it makes policy, there are two groups that the state is addressing. One, it is addressing to the political elites or elites as such, economic and political and social elites so, who have access to, who have been nurtured in the gendered norms and they have the access and control over
Ma'am, we have lost your voice, uh, Professor Kelkar. Yeah. Yes. Access to rights. Uh, last one sentence. We missed you. Uh, access to rights. Okay. Um, yes. Last one minute. If you can repeat. Yes. Representation of common yeah. people. Okay. Yeah. The, so common people rather than uh, state talks to two kind of persons. Okay. One is the political and economic elite who have access to these institutions where the state is concerned, economic and political institutions, they dominate that institution because of their knowledge, because of their position and social position in the society. Large number of men from caste and high class and high caste groups, caste and class here both combined. And th that is one class so that the state addresses them and state also addresses then the organized group of women and men who are the who are in rural areas because they want their right to vote. So policies are made, but they are not implemented. That's what I'm saying. Policies are made because they have the right, to, they have to get the right, uh, they have to get the vote because they have voting rights and numbers. And policies are not implemented because they have to uh, please or they have, they are in alignment with the political and economic elite. That's what I wanted. I want to make that why the progressive policies are made but not implemented. So overcoming injustice means dismantling institutionalized obstacles that prevent some people from participating on par with others. There is a, this, a kind of uh, um, word uh, used uh, participation parity. Well, the participation parity does not mean really within the country I'm talking about that Dalits and women have the same rights as the others have. So that would be the, uh, that. So one justice would be overcoming injustice would be dismantling these institutionalized obstacles. So women's proportionate number in parliament in other by, uh, kind of bodies, in revenue administration, if we talk of uh, revenue and land administration, if we are talking of the land rights, that is the meaning that I had in this. Then uh, Nancy Fraser also highlights participation parity in economic justice. That um, she says that uh, participation does not mean that you listen only to that. Participation also means that you have the lobby, you are participating in policy making also. So, and we, give, can, we can give this example, when any policy is made, either with the harassment of women or harassment of women at the workplace or anything, there is an organized group of women who have lobbied against it. When there is a policy made against untouchability and Dalit question, then also see that there is a whole movement going on and what has happened and then state responses. Ma'am, we lost you again. State okay. responses. Ah, okay. Ah. Can I, uh, state responses. State response, okay. I was on the kind of high, uh, uh, Nancy Fraser's theory. Participation parity means that they participate in both making policies and also they are not at the receiving end. They are also involved because they are organizing, they are protesting against the injustice policies, injustice and policies. Are you with me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma then Fraser's justice of theory is criticized for being too focused on cultural issues. I have disagreement with this criticism. In disagreements, I would say that it has relevance when we discuss the influence of social norms on economic institutions. That is important. I've done a lot of work on social norms and I was thinking whether I should talk today on social norms, but then I resisted and I said, let me talk of the land rights. Social norms really, you are all very familiar how social norms kind of limit women. This is part of our culture. This dress code, this kind of hair, this kind of food, all is considered as a part of the, this kind of education. Uh, they are all part of the social norms. That is what, it, it has nothing to do in economic status, this becomes the part. And they very much kind of influence the economic institution. Now World Bank is debating and for the first time discussing whether there is a need for head of the household or not. Because as every individual within a household 
has the right to vote, why every individual, whether woman or man, does not have the right independent, unmediated, independent economic resources. I use the word unmediated, that means these, the rights are given through the household and its head. We want really poverty reduction is seen in terms of household and its head. We need right, both individual men and women are seen like they are seen as political citizens. Uh, in the same way, they should be seen as economic citizens. Next slide, please. <coughs> next, next, next. Visible, ma'am. Yes. So who of economic justice? Who are these people who lead economic uh, justice? So, Feminist analysis have identified these connections of economic justice to freedom, non-discrimination, bodily integrity, and exploitation-free production in agriculture and industry. And now we are talking of also really a kind of non-recognition of the uh, work that work women do with regard to care economy, that is the discussion is there. They have engaged, this feminist analysis have been engaged in formulating justice issues for policies, the who of justice, who are these people? And we are not only, they are not only as a recipient of benefits from justice and policies, but also participants in formulating, forming justice or formulating justice policies, as I said uh, about the kind of, uh, that when the lobbies are being done, then only the change in policies happen. Policies do not happen just like that. For example, 2005 Amen, Hindu Succession Amendment Act, that there was a lobby of women within the organization, within Congress party, within other parties, left parties, within other even Hindu rights based parties. They were uh, parties for the economic rights of women since 1938. Then only the change happened in 2005. So this takes as long. You see, I gave the example 1996 when the a bill is lying in for the reservation of women in parliament. 14%, that is after so much achievement, 5% to 14%. And they are in proportionate number in 48% of the population. And 48% is also because of so much non-missing women. I mean, Amartya Sen calls them missing women. So infanticide, female infanticide, feticide, all this takes place. And that, that is the another story of the violence against women. The how of economic justice includes how it should be achieved, both the organizational structures at different levels and processes that can be used, organizational change we need, structural change we need, and women's groups and individual thought leaders as agents who can be consulted in formulating justice, inclusive policies, and achieving justice. Like if there is justice, injustice brought out, who can say, like just now the Madam Chair has said, that okay, let's come up with the policies, we will include these policies. But we want these policies, which India is known for making progressive policies, but not implementing them. So when we are talking policies, we are also making policies which are implementable or implemented. They are all implementable, but they are not implemented. Next slide, please. Next. What is the state? I will be quick in this. What is the state of agriculture in India? We all know there is a widespread poverty. Poverty has deepened and abided both in the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation and pandemic. So that is uh, what is strange is this only two figures. Women are 42% of the agricultural labor force in the country, yet they own less than 2% of farmland. 13% are the operational holders, according to agricultural census. So they are managers, but they are not owners. That is the kind of one uh, account that has come. No precise data on women's ownership land. Why? Indian government, I met some people about three years ago when I was um, uh, in a meeting with the, uh, where the SDGs were being discussed. India was to report on the land ownership and some other kind of achievement and SDG. And I asked this person concerned, this officer concerned from the government of India, that what we are going to appoint, how many women own land in India? And they said, we don't have the data. So we are not going to report that. So I mean, this, but why there is no data? Because India is known for producing wonderful data since the turn of the century. So you don't consider important. And that's why the, 
And repeatedly in World Economic Forum meeting in 2018 and later also, it has been reported that patriarchal traditions prevent women from having equal ownership rights to property. This is about India that has been being said. We know about what is our number, I think 112 and 136 about the uh, on women's kind of uh, condition, on women's situation, which is produced by World Economic Forum, UNDP, and others, OECD. So, according to in Human Development Survey in 2020 or 2019, irrespective of ensuring laws to women's right to agricultural land, most such land is owned by either men or undivided families with men as the household, where Dada, Chacha, all these kind of forefathers own land and they say our land is owned so we don't have the kind of this thing but these are not dadis and nannies so it is still the male kind of leadership that continues whenever you discuss the subject of farmer male picture comes whenever you discuss the kind of land ownership it is always the land is land and technology are the male subject in the agricultural uh, field next slide please so importance of land, why land is important, why I'm talking of land, some people also, some economists say, oh, the, you are, these are the outdated things. 65% of the Indian population is still depends on agriculture. And it is, uh, COVID-19 also has shown us that uh, land is so important for our food security. Mm, that is, um, land and property rights have been consciously used to keep women powerless and dependent to demean their autonomy, self-determination, equality, and personal security. I mean, women are not allowed to own land. So the, what is, both by social norms and by lack of non-implementation of the laws or by flawed laws. So the right to land defines an extensive range of power relations. It permits men to exercise horizontal and vertical control over women, which I said earlier in the horizontal is really in the social system, vertical is the policies and laws. It determines the ownership of inheritance and father's line and formulate taboos for gender structured societies, unjust rights to acquisition and distribution of holdings, denying justice and individuality to women. It, they don't have any individuality. So if there is a crisis in the family um, in terms of the violence or um, uh, failed marriage, then probably where do women go? They will continue to be there because they are nowhere to go. They cannot go to natal homes. I mean, it is nonsense to say that brothers are going to accept them. Research shows that the most kind of resistance is coming from the young men about the land distribution to girls, not from the parents so much as the brothers who think that they are going to get the land. They are the most resistance to this. I was in a morning session in a meeting in, uh, with regard to Andhra Pradesh, and I was told now panchayats have become involved in it. So the negotiations are there that uh, where panchayat is involved, that how land should be divided. And the woman, uh, the daughter would claim half a property, then brothers would agree to one fourth of property after a lot of negotiations and all this. And uh, even in this one fourth of property, then he appeals to panchayat that she can take gold and not land so that uh, she can sell it and she can do this. All kinds of explanations are given. So now the goal has become in the form of land and less than one fourth of the share. So this is the new thing that I learned today. And of course, uh, there are uh, in Haryana where we are sitting and, uh, uh, and there in Haryana at the time of marriage, dowry is reduced because if there is a haknama registered by the between the two families, marrying and marrying out, uh, families that uh, they will not claim the the in-laws family will not claim the right to land of the on behalf of the girl then the dowry is reduced so these are the new forms of the practices which we need to learn about we only when we discuss it we come to know what kind of new practices are going on but basic fundamental platform is that women do not get the right to land and that keeps them powerless independent and vulnerable so that is the most kind of unjust situation. That's why I call it a question of economic justice. Next slide, please. I will go quickly now. So it continues. And um, 
in the name of family harmony and culture women are denied right to land or energy uh, energy they don't have any right to energy also decision making by the lawful means or by lawful authorities so they are denied this right by lawful means by policies and also by lawful authorities so it is not really the robbers uh, the, some kind of joke is going on that there is a robbing bandit and there is a stationary bandit that means who is stationed within the house <coughs> And this is called that we have the stationary bandit within the household. In fact, there are all kind of things have come today, kind of uh, very, uh, very inspiring and very kind of radical. Uh, uh, YouTube uh, today has come up with uh, quite amusing and quite also surprising. But I heard this quote from in Baswara in uh, um, in um, Ra uh, not Rajasthan. Um, Maharashtra district in a village. And I was investigating something else that time I was working with Unifem. When the land is in my husband's name, I am only a worker. When it is in my name, I have some position in society and my children and my husband respect me. So my responsibility is much greater to my own land and I take care of my fields like my children. Says a woman farmer in the presence of 50 women and 20 men. What I was came as a surprise all women nodded and no man questioned. When she read this was a woman farmer, she was very much married, and but nobody objected. But I was surprised at her analysis that how there is a demand. It is not kind of women like us who are talking about the land rights. It is the women's kind of thing. So productivity will increase. What is the last sentence she says? If land is in my own name, I take care of my fields like my children. So most debated kind of thing, that is the closest kind of thing that one, so productivity increases, her respect increases, her justice increases. That's why land is so important for women. Next one, please. So women's work in agriculture and entitlement, which we have been discussing, but a significant number of women are engaged in agricultural work. Women's demand for entitlement to agricultural land is since 1940s till date. Since actually it is 1938 kind of thing or 1938 and also in the various peasant movements, Tebhaga, Telangana, which appeared, uh, appeared uh, earlier. But Landmark Act was <coughs> a kind of revolutionary act in 2005 when Hindu Succession Amendment Act was amended and it really made a kind of revolutionary change that in terms of women, Hindu women's right to own land, agricultural land was recognized on par with the men or on par with the girls right on par with the brother, that is the or son, that was the recognized. But it was ancestral property and it there has been a lack of implementation of that. So policies are formulated and implemented and put aside. Why? And this is why I tried to address that the state talks to people, to people, political elite who are nurtured in the gendered forms, uh, uh, gendered uh, norms, and also organized women and men. So for fear of change in social norms influences both state and society. So it is <coughs> social norms are not only they say the communities and individual people talk about uh, this thing. Social norms very much shape policy making actions also. People who are sitting in the parliament or experts sitting in World Bank, they also talk of social norms and they also say only those policies. So repeatedly, there is systematically, them, it is instilled in girls, very young age, what you can do and what you cannot do. Otherwise, you risk the consequences of male violence or familial exclusion. You are excluded from the family at any stage kind of thing and particularly from the marital family. Next one, please. So women's protest against this political economy uh, was that a recurring uh, kind of issue that emerged during our collective discussion in UP with women. Uh, there, uh, they said that <coughs> why, why land is not there eh, in this kind of uh, this thing. They say excuses are it is the boys who take care of the parents in their old age. These form the social norms I am talking about. In case of divorce or eviction from marital home, the brother would be expected to take responsibility for the sister. Oh, your brother is there and he will take care of you. Women or girls are given a dowry as their share of 
parental property. Social norms do not permit that a girl or woman should have an independent right to land. Joint right to land in the marital home, however, is seen less of a threat. Even if there is a joint right uh, to land, then men would manage. I mean, you are not fighting every day with your husband or partner that, okay, I will do this. This is my part of the land and this is not your part of the land. So man to man, it is the transactions continue to take place. Next slide, please. So access to justice to land, state response uh, in policy. 1938, a subcommittee was appointed before the independence of India on women's role in planned economy of the National Committee on India. They demanded equal share of land and property. And they were promised that this would happen once India is independent. Nothing happened. After, in 1980, then something happened. Joint titles to land in the six, five-year plan were given. They were uh, as part of the policy in the planned economy. In 2005, amendment of Hindu Succession Act, which I have already talked about, in 2012, 12th five-year plan, which talked about three things. Individual land titles and women's name, irrespective of their civil status. That means whether married, divorced, not married. <coughs> women's group recognized as a valid category of landowners. And then they say joint rights to women can be given if it is a group of women, not the joint kind of group of men and women or the husband and wife, but if it is a group, self-help group or other kind of collective, they can have a collective category, a collective ownership of land. The past joint titles to be made with partitionable rights. But what about the past, the joint titles that were distributed? They will be made with partitionable rights. This was the most kind of, I thought, very important change in the 12th five-year plan. And it was after consultation with the feminist economists in India. They, they have set up a group which was called Feminist Economist Group by Planning Commission. In 2013, the draft national land reform policy reiterated the 12th five-year plans, which I talked about above. But in 2014, the <coughs> election changed the regime and everything was shelved. In 2016, however, a draft national policy for women by Ministry of Women and Child Development. And this is a quote from that uh, draft. Regarding resource rights of women, effort will be made to prioritize women in all government land distribution, land purchase and land lease scheme to enable women to own and control land through issue of individual and joint, joint land pattas. And in private, quote continues, I could not quote the whole thing. In, this was in government land. In private land, they said we will in, introduce the schemes of concessional uh, stamp duty and transfer duty, which happened, but this did not happen. Uh, significantly this year, in February 2021, which is very important, Uttarakhand, go Uttarakhand government has passed an ordinance to give land ownership rights to daughters and wives of male landowners. So if any man has the land in his name, he has to give his land, <coughs> half of the land to daughters when they are unmarried. And when they are married, the husband has to give the, that kind of land, half of the land to wives because this is also a recognition of the work that is being done. So these are the, this ordinance has come very recently. So I'm also looking at the details of this, but I read it in the uh, news. So that is a very important, challenging kind of thing, uh, ordinance, government ordinance. They have amended the uh, Zamindari system in that uh, uh, amendment was made and our ordinance was passed. Next slide, please. So major barriers to women's entitlement of land, Lack of recognition of women's unmediated right to land and property, requirement of approval from the family or the spouse and travel mobility. They can't travel, even their homes, they cannot travel, parental home. Cultural taboos on women's freedom to assert their right to own land and productive assets. Lack of finances or property of their own required for an independent existence. Neglect of the state in providing adequate services and protecting women from violence within the home and outside. Laws are there, they are not implemented, and they are flawed laws. There are many loopholes in the laws. That's what I'm calling flawed laws. That would be the. I was recently uh, an advisor to the garment uh, sector study and surprised that how much violence was there on women workers within the kind in the workplaces how they were touched, how they were abused in terms of kind of working in the, 
in the factory and including some data came from Tirpur and I was surprised that how their sexuality is seen as the kind of um, exchange for <coughs> good work, efficient work. Next sl slide, please. So effect of land ownership in women's voice, I have already talked about, but uh, uh, other women said, which is the, uh, again, focus group discussion, and it comes from a backward state like Uttar Pradesh, okay? Men listen to us because we control our land, cash and assets. So women say that when we have the land, then men listen to us. And also increase in capabilities and decision making. They some, gave some examples how the, uh, their education, their role of decision making, they are consulted in the communities. Women have acquired some power now as a result of owning land. This is a quote. In full agreement with others, a middle-aged woman added, now we are suction. Saksham is the capability, okay? We have freedom of movement, self-confidence, and independence. We can manage our own assets and our own life. <coughs> so this is the, so see how they are realizing the importance of land. It is not people like uh, Simi or Govind or others like who are talking. It is the women whose voices we need to really recognize. Then we have the regression results of the kind of thing. And that showed the probability of women participating in decision making on children's education, control over their earnings and number of births. Is, these are all positively related with the land ownership. So this was the kind of big study that we did. It was also published later in the Agrarian Journal of um, South uh, uh, coming from uh, Southern Center. Uh, next slide. We can skip this slide because this is the same thing which I have said. This is the quantitative analysis we done. Next slide, please. That how they are they develop their ability. Five district study. This slide also we can skip. Consumption patterns goes up. These are the items of consumption: pulses, ghee, oil. When women have the kind of um, uh, land and other asset right, then these things increase. Yeah. Next one. So technology provision for women. Now there has been some change, uh, that is the, but uh, a conference was there in 2012 and uh, a, another survey was conducted in 2015 and 16 that Ministry of Agriculture carried the survey and what they found that if women do not have, because technology is another domain of men, a woman uses her fingertips <coughs> 522 times, fingernails 144 times, and her palm 50 times for every single kilogram of grain she produces. This was for the mage cow. Corn. And then they think, oh, the women do need technology. Even something like corn sellers. I mean, simple thing technology was not developed. Now they have. India, and then somebody said this kind of thing. It is a very shameful act. This is the executive vice chairman of the India National Innovation Foundation said that India can send missiles and the orbits, but actually it cannot do for women. An international conference on women's work in agriculture, its impact on productivity, which happened in Delhi. Policy heard from 700 participants and from 50 countries. And the suggestion was the need to change technology to meet the needs of women agricultural workers and make these affordable and accessible. Male bias in tool use in cultures where machinery is regarded as the domain of men, the technological change in favor of the male task is much faster than in women's task. So even in US uh, goes a joke that um, dishwashers were introduced, uh, soon, soon men took over the dishwashing function. So how the machine can help kind of uh, changing the power structures within the household or changing the task within the household if the machinery is there besides agriculture. Next slide, please. So as a result in 2016, we, uh, uh, government uh, changed the uh, kind of very kind of women friendly, introduce a farm women friendly handbook by Ministry of Agriculture of Government of India. And it launched eight schemes and missions for women farmers included. Agricultural Technology Management Agency, Mission for Integrated Development, Horticulture, National Mission on Oil Seeds, Oil Palm, Integrated Scheme for Agricultural Marketing, National Food Security, National Mission for <coughs> Sustainable Agriculture, Submission on Agriculture Mechanization and Agricultural Insurance. What is important in this, the, uh, this thing? 
Under these provisions, a woman farmer could approach local government at the block or sub-district level to buy a modern agricultural machinery on a woman-specific subsidized rate. To my surprise, subsidized rate was somewhere between 20 to 40 percent, even in somewhere, a, in one case it was 60 percent. Higher subsidy for a woman farmer than for a man. But did women get this subsidy? They did not get, they were not farmers because they did not own land. Okay, so the in Tamil Nadu in particular, I investigated this, and they received many applications, but the ministry's sub office could not could not give them this kind these subsidies because they were not farmers; they did not have the land in their names. Next one, please. It is the continuation of this. So, listing of numerous energy-based agricultural machinery under National Mission of Agricultural Extension and Technology and Submission kind of concession, certainly commendable policy effort. But these were the machineries, see that, tractors, reapers, hole diggers, horticulture tools, <coughs> all which women use, seed bearers and all this, thistle plow, grass. So it was a very comprehensive technology. One cannot say sprayers, post harvest processing technology. But, and there was a provision also before I come to but, Training of programs on gender-friendly equipment for women farmers are to be conducted by farm machinery training and testing institutes. And at least 30% allocation of the fund is to be made for women farmers. Now, this was a palliative. This was a pill that was shown that, look how much we have done for women farmers. But if women farmers were not there because they did not own agricultural land, then where do you create women farmers? That is the so the basic definition of the farmers did not change. That is the kind of, which struggle is still going on lobby. Makam is involved, I am involved, Nitya Rao is involved, so many of us are involved. That is the, next one. Effective and implementation, our research conducted in the state of Odisha, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. That was the kind of earlier UP, but it shows really, including Kerala, the subsidized agricultural machinery have not reached women. A significant majority of the women do not own land and they therefore are not farmers. Only land ownership defines the status of a person as a farmer. Men have started transfer, transferring land in women's name. We saw in case of Odisha, this is a welcome sign, though only in tiny part because now they have access to agricultural equipment on women specific higher subsidies. So that higher subsidies which was introduced because of social norms, 20 to 60%, I learned from in uh, Orissa that yes, men are coming, they are transferring a tiny piece of land, so women become landowner, and then they get this kind of subsidy on part of that. And these negotiations are carried between men to men, this mean with the local government officers who are mostly men, and women have remained confined to the household and agricultural work. So this is the question of exclusion and privilege and social norms that was the that was being discussed. So this is the state of effectiveness or implementation. <coughs> However, where women were engaged in non-household income earning activities, they could increase their bargaining power and decision making. That also we saw that. If they were there, there were kind of they were engaged and they were bought agricultural equipment for themselves, both in UP and also in the state and other studies which has the states of Orissa, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. Next one, please. So fragmented voices, uh, two, three slides more, I think. During our initial field visits, we noticed that, and you would also notice that women themselves are kind of, if you ask them the question, who are you going to give your land? Then two kinds of answers would be there. Oh, land would be given to the sun, but jewelry would be given to women and other things would be given in the dowry. That is that they say that. So there are fragmented voices. So it is not only men who are kind of patriarchal, have patriarchal mindset. There is also this kind of very kind of automatic, what is default options like we have. Default option is that a land belongs to men, both kind of both women and men, uh, sorry, to men and not to women. So more than half of the women firmly agreed that they in the RO area in Uttar Pradesh, I saw that, that uh, who have gained dignity and respect within their household as a result of land ownership. And that's why land should be given to women. But there were about quarter of the respondents, this is about 118 household I'm talking about, who did not say that there was any reduction in shouting or beating in their homes. So said land rights do not make any difference. My husband was beating me earlier, he still beats me. So let the land go anywhere 
whether it is with a boy or with a girl these were the answers that came so there is fragmented fragmentation in terms of the voices on the joint titling of the land but in haryana study we found then when the land was given in the uh, woman's name where they the uh, sole ownership was woman she said if you raise your hand she threatened uh, the husband in a, in a um, state like haryana if you raise your hand then i am walking out of the house and i'll go with my piece of land and this woman very kind of with a smile said after that he shouts in standing in a corner but he never raises his hand he dare not touch me so look at the kind of the implicit gain that women have got with the land the how much it affects the violent non violence also next one please so gender transformational change i'm talking about first thing we need to do why land governance has failed women a continuing development tradition of man as the head of the household with determining power ownership and decision making that is one factor he is the head of the household he has the veto power to decide what needs to be done what doesn't need to be done women's low level of awareness of legal policies and a general reluctance to assert their inheritance and ownership rights it it it's started happening now which i am surprised i see lot more women quietly saying oh i have also filed a case for my share in the house uh, these uh, women are in some where employed women in better of situation and uh, they have uh, asked their brothers or parents particularly brothers for their share of uh, rights so women's lack of economic power which leads to their silence and lack of bargaining power both within the home and outside so these are the really reasons where the why the land laws or land governance has failed women another would be that in the land revenue administration patwaris there is there are no women in many states i find some examples in gujarat but i don't see in up i don't see anywhere kind of thing that uh, uh, women patwaris are there who really market uh, the division who marks the division not market mark the division of the kind of how much land to which one and they are the kind of make the people zamindar and make the people landless next one so some propellants of change and that's why some flowers are there little bit on the tree how how of economic justice a spread of knowledge about rural women's large scale involvement in agricultural work and the policy recognition of this work entitlement and need for skill development now this is these are the kind of i am talking of the policy recognition policy recognition those who are the policy makers and policy implementers the official acknowledgement of women's major responsibility for agricultural work they acknowledge it that it is the 74 76% women are engaged rural women are engaged in agriculture work but so what don't do anything still the men are continuing to be in the kind of in the name of the family harmony uh, and to be the owners but if their two brothers are there they don't become enemies they are still loving brothers and two own different kind of land rights so that is the i am just saying that it is for family harmony is really not the kind of question that needs kind of consideration in this demand from women's movement civil society organizations for women's unmediated land and asset rights what we want is women's unmediated independent land and asset rights productive as including housing rights water rights i mean we want this kind of all but particularly i work on land so i am talking of the land because this is the most critical kind of platform on which women can stand a fight of civil society and women's movement and recognizing and building economic agency of women in agriculture that is that now uh, i was uh, uh, look um, this morning i was hearing about and i was chairing this session where it seems like now knowledge of women in farming some people are working on this knowledge of women in farming hmm? uh, saminathan foundation is working on this and this is a kind of this building economic agency of women in agriculture is important how much they know about aquaculture they know a lot i when i was in ait asian institute of technology i was involved also women in aquaculture i was surprised that how much they knew about it mobilization of women farmers for claims making their rightful ownership to land and property we need to mobilize more women for their claims making appointment of 50% of women in land and revenue administration not only in panchayat this 30% women is really not enough we want 50% as they are in the population 
and building gender responsive attitudes of agricultural and land administration. So besides the revenue administration, we need to have gender responsive attitudes of men in general and also some women. Also women also hold patriarchal attitudes. So that gender responsive attitudes need to be built. Thank you, I think. Hmm? Sorry, did I take more time? I no, no, it was very interesting, extremely interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kelka. I request Simi Thank now to take it forward. I think the discussants uh, will now take over. There are five discussants, and each will speak for about five to six minutes maximum. Simi, you mentioned that uh, there is somebody who wants to leave early. Professor Kaka, uh, am I yeah. audible? Yes, Professor Kaka. Uh, Anshula? Yes, so should I introduce? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Please. Okay, so please. we have as our first discussant, uh, Professor Virginia Kaka, who is a professor of eminence at the Eastport University, Assam. Over to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it, uh, it was, it has been a fascinating presentation. Uh, and uh, I have no difference in opinion. Uh, my only concern is that so long as we focus on the very, very macro situations, I think things work out very well. So if you just focus on the household and then we try to address the uh, questions of inequality or unfreedom, and try to make a more inclusive uh, inclusive equality. I think that looks really fair, but I think uh, uh, as of today, we find that macro situation is no longer, you know, uh, com uh, completely isolated or it is a completely autonomous. It is integrated with the larger political economy. And uh, but as a part of the larger political economy, you find it is integrated with the state, it is integrated with the market. And uh, they, on the one hand, market may also, in a way, provide a freedom. Uh, it may, it may, it may attack the unkind of free, un, unfreedom, but then it also reproduces uh, inequality and injustice and so on and so forth. So there's a double-edged uh, kind of issues that really comes from. On the one hand, we are trying to address a certain kinds of inequality which exists in a family or in a community or in a village. But at the same time, you find the larger political economy is actually through unleashing various kinds of social forces. In fact, is also creating a different kind of, uh, let's say, uh, what is called uh, inequality and so on. So, so I think uh, we have to really look at uh, where we are really pitching in terms of addressing the inequality. Because yes, maybe we are able to bring about a gender parity, but then you find that the larger level of the society or the village, you find that the inequality is actually is 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 is. is, is is aggravating. So that is one I thought is a, is a so it's micro and macro. I think uh, this dilemma will always be there and as to how we really address because uh, the uh, inequality at the macro level cannot really be addressed without taking into account the, the, the questions of the macro, macro level. The Professor other is- Kaka, of, Professor yeah. Kaka, do you mind uh, turning on your video? Oh, sorry, I is not turned. Oh, <laughs> sorry. It's okay, sir. Thank yeah, you yeah. so much. The other, I think, is uh, is uh, uh, also what uh, since I have a little bit uh, been a little bit working on the tribal communities. One of the issues that we all find is that because of these connections with the wider world, the larger market, you also find that great deal of uh, what is it called the real or what is it called the disposition of the land and resources not only through the state acquisition of land for mineral exploitations and dams and other things, but also you find that there is a lot of transfer of land from the Adivasi communities to the non-tribal communities through various kinds of institutional mechanisms, you know, through the state support and so on and so forth, despite the fact that the law which tries to in a way protect. And the protective law is primarily trying to see and address in certain sense, certain kinds of equality, certain kinds. So I think th this is a, the, basically point that I have is that how do we really link the macro and the macro situation? That's, the other is that, uh, 
the the maybe we can demolish one kind of inequality but then we can create another kind of uh, another kind of inequality this is the problem that we really want to come uh, also i find is that um, you know what we do in a society like india where we are a multicultural kind of a society and uh, you know this relationship between as a sociologist we find that the relation between individual and collectivity individual society is a perennial problem so how do we really look at this uh, this 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 whole questions of the relationship between individual and community individual and collectivity individual family uh, 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 so I, I think we, uh, there's a need to give some thought to it. How, how do we really conceptualize this? Is this uh, completely a kind of becomes an individual aggregate of the members or you find that there's much more than that? Uh, also, I find that uh, what kind of policies we really want because I think we have moved to uh, a state of economy or state of society where we have done away with the planning because planning is one dimension which is to bring about or address the issue of let's say equality, justice, fairness, and so on. But then we have really done away with that now. Since the 2014, I don't think that really matters anymore. And uh, therefore the, uh, the policy alone, uh, uh, a policy to a great extent also stems from the planning. But if there is no planning, then how do we really address the questions of the policy? And I think, uh, so this, this will market alone and the policy will really be able to address these questions that you are trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, examine. And finally, I just think that uh, uh, what kind of policies we really want in the sense that if you really make a policy a general, like say, for example, women as a whole, uh, and if you find that, uh, will that work for, let's say, uh, women who are from the Dalit community or you find from the tribal community or from other kinds of communities. So a general policy for the women as a whole, will it going to have the same kind of implications for the women who are actually divided into different kind of caste, different kind of cultural community and so on and so forth. So that, these are some of the dilemmas that I have. I have no problem is that I think uh, as far as the addressing the issue of the gender equality is very, very important. I think uh, at the, even at the level of the families that is there, but then these larger issues are there and as to how we do we really grapple with it. This is the, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Kaka. Uh, next, we have Professor Indu Agni Hutri, who was formerly the director of the Center for Women's Development Studies, CWDS, New Delhi. Ma'am, over to you. Uh, okay, my screen is so I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Impri, for inviting me here. And thank you, Govind, for a very, very comprehensive presentation combining uh, both macro context as well as uh, the micro situations, uh, also based on your own uh, re research and interaction with uh, women at the ground level. We have uh, you given it a wide sweep and uh, uh, especially i think the focus on in the latter part on social norms and prejudices and the obstacles that exist i think those are very important points i would just like to um, uh, uh, raise a few points just in a sense reiterating what you have already said but maybe emphasizing them uh, in a different way I think uh, when we discuss uh, women and agriculture, we need to understand that the prejudice against women is uh, not only historical, but it is historical in terms of its structural embeddedness within the policies. And this is something that uh, I see from my own research uh, in terms of colonial India. And uh, the British regime uh, had this very contradictory sort of uh, content and context to its uh, policies. It was, uh, uh, it flourished and it um, uh, extracted surplus 
based on the labor of farmers, of agriculturalists, cultivators at different levels, and that included women. However, in terms of their official policy, documentation, framing of the laws, etc., there was a very clear bias and a kind of negation of women's work, women's presence, and women's contribution both to the economy, to agriculture, and therefore also in terms of the larger uh, uh, context of uh, building their uh, empire in India. And I think that stemmed from their own uh, experience and their own context of sort of the values and the roles that Victorian England had uh, sort of projected, whereby therefore women were not seen as being productive beings and contributing to production, contributing to the economy. Now, this is not just a, a hallmark of British imperialism. We know that this kind of patriarchal bias exists all over, all through history. So I think from both in terms of the policy interventions that have come from the pioneers in women's studies and the women's movement, you mentioned the historic report of uh, the, the women's role in uh, a planned economy. And I think the CSWI, that is towards equality, also made a very critical note of women's role in the rural economy. And the point that Professor Kaka was also mentioning, which is there sort of, you have not spelt it out in any major way in your presentation, but obviously it is there in your work, a larger body of work, in terms of the non-homogeneity of the category of women and women uh, from different castes, communities having both different roles to play as well as different rights or lack of rights. And therefore, any policies that we think of and any policy of ex, uh, inclusion has to sort of integrally build that aspect into uh, our envisaging alternatives. Uh, you uh, continuously mention the elite groups, and I think that is what you are, in a sense, talking about. But the resistance that uh, the land-owning castes and communities, and the land-owning castes were sort of embedded in the law by, by British uh, legislation. I have always maintained that what we see as caste today is not something just that came naturally in terms of a historical process of development, but the British uh, sort of made it justiciable in terms of differential rights of castes and communities. Uh, particularly, for instance, I could see it in the region that I studied, which was Punjab, where they entered into an extensive study of land-owning castes and therefore uh, who was entitled to uh, purchase, uh, transfer, inherit, etc. But I think the women's movement has uh, uh, taken this, these issues up at different levels. First, in terms of recognition and visibility. Uh, which you also talked about in terms of the theoretical discussions, whether it's Nancy Fraser or others. The, but an equal, and that has also led to this whole demand and focus on rights in terms of inheritance, land rights, ownership, uh, which is absolutely critical. I would not dispute your uh, positions that you have put forward in terms of how land ownership would um, and uh, ownership of any kind of assets would give a uh, handle to women to uh, maybe not stop domestic violence, but at least try to negotiate it. Nevertheless, I think what we have always felt is that the discussion on land rights somehow uh, and entitlements has not necessarily showcased and foregrounded the uh, women's role in production, which I'm glad you brought out here, especially in your uh, discussion with regard to technology and changes, and how uh, the introduction of technology in agriculture displaces women in many more ways, at many more levels, and it sort of uh, reinstates prejudice and male bias in the whole process also. Because I think the uh, a uh, huge loss of work that women are facing and loss of work opportunities that women are facing both in agriculture and in non-farm employment.
movement in rural India is what is driving migration of women. Astonishing that despite so much study on migration, somehow women's uh, sort of place in this migration story still remains largely un sort of recognized. Even in the discussions on migration around the pandemic, we found that women, even though there were visuals of women, but somehow there was a kind of marginalization. And I think uh, uh, what Professor Kaka was also pointing to in terms of displacement, dispossession, um, loss of uh, forest resources, loss of, uh, loss of economic resources have posed issues of livelihood for specific communities specific in spe uh, specific regional locations. But I think what you have tried to do today in trying to link the economic justice agenda with the social sort of norms, with the social violence that women are uh, facing, I think that really needs to be built on further. Why I'm raising it is because even though the women's movement in present times has focused uh, unambiguously on violence, but somehow the agenda of economic justice, of redistributive justice in terms of um, social structures and access to uh, resources has either been taken up in the NGO frameworks and dialogues, but in the visible movement that we see today, somehow the economic justice redistribution, um, economic rights, work issues uh, over the last 20, 25 years, when those inequalities have in increased remarkably with the neoliberal paradigm, in remarkably, uh, un I mean, unambiguously, this has happened, but somehow they have not been uh, foregrounded except by the left-oriented mass women's organizations. And I think that remains a very big challenge. Um, you, you've already talked about caste, class, and the custom aspects, etc. I'm not going to repeat all that. But I would just like to say two, three things. Uh, one is focus on uh, reiterate Professor Kaka's point that if the macro context is moving in the the opposite direction for women to get demand uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, realize equality becomes even more challenging. I would refer to one document which is hardly ever sort of taken note of and that is that the National Commission for Women in 2010, between 2009 and 10, it uh, drew up a draft national policy for women in agriculture which raises and points to many of the issues that we are facing, in, including in the present agitation of the farmers, which has, which has completed more than 100 days now. It raises the issue of landlessness, of definition of women farmers, and we find that when farmers' suicides happen, uh, both in terms of the farmers who commit suicide as well as the entitlements, etc., the kind of issue you raised about um, uh, women not being uh, recognized and therefore not being uh, uh, able to realize their entitlements. The issue of food uh, security and feminization of agriculture and feminization of poverty, I think these are interlinked. The knowledge aspect in terms of the knowledge that women had and have of uh, farming, farming techniques, etc., is something we really do need to preserve along with um, calculations, along with recognition in terms of unpaid uh, work by women. But I think what we are seeing, I'd like to end on that note, I think what we are seeing in independent India after a very long time is, in a sense, the assertion of the power of the peasantry. And the power of the peasantry uh, is something that we see in radical movements that you also mentioned pre prior to independence. But somehow the farmers, the peasantry, rural India is not central in this globalization story that we see of double digit growth, etc., prior to the pandemic. And the women are totally missing. So women's presence in this ag agitation, in a sense, is an effort and is a very conscious, I think, 
uh, assertion of uh, a sort of a reclaiming a terrain, reclaiming both visibility and a terrain. What is most uh, shocking, of course, remains that just as we see in the nature of honor crimes in India and the whole question that you talked of, of denial of uh, property and inheritance despite legal changes. But I think the fact that there is an overall context of lack of uh, freedom, lack of democratic debate and dis discussion, that st stands totally at cross purposes with women's assertion, women's aspiration, and their effort to get recognition both in terms of status, their role, and their contribution, and their rights in terms of the movement. So I think we're still a long way ahead and a long challenge, big challenge ahead in terms of both the struggles as well as studies on those struggles and on those. So thank you, Kovin. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank you, Professor Agnihotri, for your comments. Uh, next, we have Dr. Francis Raj, who is Chief Research Advisor at the Center for Human Security Studies, Hyderabad. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Nivedita and uh, Please go on. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, Professor Govind Kelkar for an excellent presentation. I think uh, um, uh, you have touched upon a very important issue of land rights. I actually come from, I hail from a uh, farming community. My father was a farmer, unemployed, rural farmer, uneducated, illiterate farmer. And uh, so I come from that background. And uh, uh, I, um, having heard to all of you, my I'm slightly taking a little different approach here. And of course, I am a uh, women's rights activist. So I'm here because of that. Uh, so I totally agree. And there's nothing to debate about it. Um, but then we are right now, for the past almost 65 years, we have been ruled by the Congress and allies. Whenever the Congress party or uh, uh, the leftist supported by leftist organizations, uh, we had a governments where there were more uh, 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 there was more freedom to exercise, and wherever whenever there is freedom, women are able to. Uh, you know, uh, fight for their rights, ask for their rights, do something about it. But right now we are in a uh, nationalist party, we are in a uh, totally right political party, wherein uh, women's rights has taken a backseat. And women have taken a backseat. We don't see those kind of fights. We don't see, women themselves are not, uh, are afraid of actually coming out openly and expressing themselves. We are in that kind of situation, wherein a, just a 22 year old is arrested and jailed, you know, just for talking. Toolkits are, uh, toolkits, you know, basically they jail uh, young people in India. So that is the situation we are in right now. But Any rights movement today, we are, we have reached a situation where we are, where women are in this world, is because of a lot of sacrifices, a lot of uh, uh, um, struggle that has gone till this stage that we are in right now. But what is the road ahead? What is the future ahead? How long is it going to continue like this? And uh, how can we make a change in this? You take, uh, we talk about women's reservation for instance. This government, before it came into power, it said because uh, it supported women's reservation bill in the parliament. And now they have a good majority, but they are not able to do anything. They are not doing anything. Basically, because it is all uh, the governments are playing one against the other. See, the power is in the hands of men now. Without involving men, women's equality, women's uh, uh, equal status in the society is not possible. 
Why? Because women, sorry, men have to move aside, create space for women, and so that the women who are in need, women who actually need the, the, that fifty percent of their status, that is, which is due to them, if they have to access it, then women have to, men have to move aside and let women come forward. Now, when we talk about women's movements, women equality, it is more of feminism and it is more of, you know, it has become a fashion or it has become a style. Oh, it is women. It is women's rights. It is their rights. So let them fight for it. Let them earn their rights. Let them, you know, um, uh, let them fight for it, struggle for it. That is what the concept is. And if somebody else, if farmers are fighting, oh, it is farmers' rights. Let them fight. Oh, it is Punjab farmers. Let them fight. Haryana farmers, let them fight. It is not Indian farmers. And um, our governments are very successfully differentiating or dividing us in this fashion. That is one. The next component is uh, uh, the, I will come to this um, pensions and other free doles that the government is giving. Ideally, what we expect is a government to create jobs, employment income generation activities so that people generally have they have a decent you know um, uh, um, um, uh, their right to claim and also um, um, uh, um, self confidence and their individuality is protected but here what is happening is government instead of creating a job for a family let us say a small nuclear family if the government creates a job, then the job holder of that particular person, maybe one or two people in that family, maybe husband and wife, or wife and husband, whoever it is, if they are employed, then they can the family can have a decent life. But today, what is happening is government is willing to give a small small token amount called pension to the wife, to the husband, and to maybe the old people, and altogether it might cost them about four five thousand or maximum ten thousand rupees per month. But if the government has to give job to one person in that particular family, it would almost cost about 30, 40 or 50,000 maybe. Government doesn't, it, it is looking for cheap tricks. It is looking for, uh, you know, this scapegoat mechanism, basically. So when such, when, we, and it is successfully dividing people. Women are getting divided. Women are getting divided on the basis of economy, on the basis of income, on the basis of caste and sex and whatnot, you know. So, so if if equality has to be achieved, if women empowerment has to be achieved, then struggle is the only. Like the farmers that they are doing right now, uh, as uh, Dr. Pr Professor Indu has rightly mentioned, you know, struggle is is the key thing there. Without struggle, we have not achieved. Without struggle, human beings have not achieved anything. So women have to unite. And women have to take men to, along with them because women alone cannot do. Because women are not independent right now. Women, if they have to come out from their families, their family members have to contribute time, have to um, uh, do things which men, women are doing right now. And they have to take the, uh, uh, share the burden of work. And so that, that thing should begin at home. It, it should begin at home and then slowly it has to come out. And so this, these are my perceptions. I mean, nothing to differentiate, nothing to disagree with you all. And I'm open for discussion. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Francis. Um, next we have Dr. Manorma Bakshi. Uh, she is a social development and public health professional and an independent consultant, as well as a visiting researcher at M3. Over to you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Hello, am I audible? Simi? Yes, ma'am. Very clearly, yes. Yes, ma'am, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Go Govin, for such an insightful presentation. And I'm very thankful to other colleagues also who have, uh, Dr. Haran and others who have spoken, especially Raj and Indu and uh, Dr. Khaka on these issues on uh, Women's uh, International uh, Day 
and especially like on the topic like you know land rights and others but i will be touching some different points i'll be talking more about the public health i'll be talking more about my experiences from the ground of uh, almost like 20 years i have been in public sector domain and i have been actually traveling across india 184 high priority districts wherein there is maternal mortality is at highest so i'll be talking more about the field experiences that i had as a public health professional so my experiences i feel that when it comes to i will touch up briefly about like the kind of uh, you know we have kept ashas and anganwadi workers like almost 70 lakhs of them are there across india i mean their challenges and we have always kept them as like you know volunteers and they get a meager salary so those are the issues which i i would like to raise and number second is what i see is that um, recently sometime back i was in comprehensive review mission of government of india to chatisgarh wherein when i was talking to these ashas and anganwadi workers they said some of the people and especially male folk they came forward and said madam aap logo ne to inko bilkul tabahi kar diya hai pehle to because chatisgarh was the state which had in it introduced the concept of voluntary health worker and that was mitanin at that time they were not calling them as ashas they were calling them as mitanins so they said that aapne to inko bilkul kharab kar diya now for every single thing they are asking for money but this is the big thing which we see that even some of the areas like knowing the topography of india and asha worker works almost 10 kilometers on foot also and but they are paid very very meager or you can say like uh, amounts so i would definitely as a policy person i would like to raise this issue and um, uh, i would like to uh, look into it number second which i see as a policy person working in the domain is gender budget for last almost 10 years we have been actually harping on almost on you know the gender budget has been same across like we had initiated gender budget out of the total budgetary expenditure in around like 2001 we had initiated it in 2005 4 it was around like uh, 4.5% and then it has risen to 5.1 in 18 19 and now again due to covid we have seen it coming down to 4.7 which i again see that if you uh, further sort of like look deeper into this you'll find out that only five ministries it comes to the five ministries like whether we are talking about the rural development ministry women and child education and um, these are the major ministries that they take 90% of the total kind of you can say the budget of the uh, gender budget my concern is like why we don't have the ministries like msme where in like women we know like 90% of the people are working in unorganized sector so that these kind of women can gain some kind of you know um uh, i think that as a policy person we need to talk on these issues also where in the money is going on my second concern is that uh, for last one decade we have seen from 33% of female labor participation it has come down to 17.5% and now if we will go by what niti ayog has envisioned in, in niti ayog india at 75 which is just 3 years from now what we as a policy maker or researchers how we can inform the policy that within 3 years what they have envisaged that 30% of the women will be in a, will be in the labor force participation when we see that the decline is almost going deeper and deeper so that is one of the things uh, i would like to raise and we would like to look into that uh, how we will address that and one more thing which i see is um now uh, recently i mean just yesterday someone had put it in uh, the social domain linkedin it really touched my heart it was actually the paytm had done some kind of social uh, exercise within the employees when in they had seen like 30 uh, participants participated in this whole activity and they had seen how many women know actually about or are owning the vehicles on their own names or they have the uh, houses in their own names or they have the they know about the financial you know uh, investments and for every step one man was moving one step ahead and a female was moving one step ahead and for every not knowing that these things uh, exist they had to move one step behind and unfortunately in the end they have seen that all the women were uh, behind and there were only three women who were knowing 
something or the other on that front. So these are some of the things I think that we as policy person need to address. And we need to look into the desegregated women's data separately. We also need to look into like recently Khattar has said that he has introduced in Haryana that only Haryana bees can have, uh, you know, below 50,000 uh, salary, almost 70% of them can uh, should be Haryana bees. I think we need states also need to introduce these kind of like, you know, mechanisms wherein that we can talk to private sector and tell them that this X number of percentage you need to give to the women. For that, we need to have a larger voice. We need to talk on those terms. So these are some of the things that uh, come to my uh, mind immediately. And thank you once again, Dr. Kerikar, for wonderful uh, presentation and insights. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very good suggestions. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Um, finally, we have uh, Dr. G. Shri Devi, who is an associate professor uh, in the School of Economics at the University of Hyderabad. Ma'am, over to you. Yeah, uh, good evening uh, to all of you and happy Women's Day. Uh, it was a very systematic presentation by Professor Kelker on the land rights. Uh, since, uh, I mean, we have been hearing on the access to land by the various class and the caste groups in terms of gender, uh, most important, um, another important aspect is access to commons also. Generally, we, we uh, ignore while talking about the access to the land. The discrimination on the basis of race or caste or gender or source of um, situations of the access of the commons is uh, very, very common in uh, uh, rural India. Uh, the, the discrimination is manifested not only in the form of the uh, material and economic access also, uh, but also through social and psychological, uh, political indigeneity associated with the accessing the uh, commons, basically. Because when the access to common, the general idea is that they are free and equally accessible to everyone in the village. Uh, but there are various um, stories what we hear uh, when um, Dalit women try to access the actually these common resources, they always uh, has to face a kind of insult or a kind of an atrocities uh, because most of these common resources are again controlled by the uh, upper caste groups in the village. Uh, the uh, so it is always a kind of a vulnerable feeling for the Dalit women to have access to the commons. So there is um, in most of the places now Dalit women are also trying to demand to have the a kind of a common place in uh, villages to uh, release their natural uh, calls, whatever it may be, so that to, they, they will have a certain kind of a, a dignity. Yeah, but uh, the caste plays a very, very crucial role in the process of gender discrimination. Although we say that uh, based upon uh, certain studies argue that class and caste are the same for the gender, it is not. Even the, the lowest income group uh, female who comes from an upper caste has a different kind of a privileges in uh, even in urban space or the rural space, but when it comes to the Dalit woman, uh, it is it is highly discriminatory in nature. So the show without targeting or questioning the social equality, uh, talking about the um, economic equality or economic justice uh, is not always uh, possible because we see many of even. Uh, women coming from the Dalit communities who are in a very high position like IAS or whatever, the, the so-called academia, the top writers, and uh, they always say that uh, based upon their intellectual abilities, they're respected. But when somebody comes to know their caste, it is again um, a kind of a different feeling what they face it. So it is a more struggle for the Dalit women uh, to stand up uh, within the uh, society. Or 
whatever, even politically. The second aspect I want to talk is the, uh, the glass ceiling or prejudice uh, feedback effects generally affect the access to the resources by the uh, Dalit women in terms of the education or in terms of the access to the healthcare. And, and, and we look into the various data sources in terms of malnutrition and anemia also, Dalit women face the highest percentage of the Dalit women and the Dalit children uh, undergo the malnutrition and anemia. So in such contest, uh, the, uh, the contribution by these groups to the uh, productivity will be reduced. And that productivity is reduced because of the existing inequality in the society uh, rather than the, their abilities. So taking gender concerns into account when designing and implementing various programs is important for two reasons. That is, uh, there are differences between the roles of men and women and various gender roles are different. And also there is a systematic inequality exists among the gender. Women, within the uh, women, again, we also have the third gender, which has the less access to the resource and the opportunities. And low participation of the women in decision-making at uh, household level or at the various uh, decision-making or policy-making body level is one of the important reasons why some of these policies are not able to be implemented. So this pattern of inequality is a constraint to the progress of any society because it limits the opportunities of uh, one half of its population as of now. Like uh, if, if we consider the political reservations, uh, Recently, Andhra Pradesh has undergone the uh, panchayat elections. Many of the Dalit men and women became the panchayat president. But uh, that is because they are reserved seats. And women, among the women, it is Dalit reserves. But are they able to uh, take decisions with the, I mean, do they have that kind of a power? There are examples in Tamil Nadu where the panchayat president was forced to sit on the floor, whereas other members were sitting on chains because they belong to the upper caste. So unless until uh, we, we address these kind of social inequality, uh, it, it is very difficult to handle the uh, or bring the equality within the various uh, social groups or with the uh, gender. So I, I strongly agree, uh, as Professor Kelka was saying, that access to land is an important attribute to have an economic equality. Like uh, even in Telangana government, when it was formed, they tried to distribute the three acres of land for the Dalit women. The land was registered on the land uh, on women of the household action. So it actually generated income. It also changed the uh, household structure in the sense the mother started sending the children to the various schools, either it is private or public. So that way access to land made access to the education for the children. So in the long run, that will have a positive impact of the household. And now same is the case with the self-help groups of Andhra Pradesh where uh, chief minister is trying to provide the uh, empowerment through the entrepreneurship to the female members of the household, giving them the 70,000 rupees or so to start their own entrepreneurship. So, uh, um, but, but my strong feeling is until, until uh, we question or we tackle the social discrimination, talking about the economic discrimination um, or political equality um, may not be, yeah, uh, I mean, we, we may not be achieve it unless until we reduce the social inequality, we may not achieve the economic and the political equality. 
that's it. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm, I'm done, uh, Simi. Thank you. Simi, ma'am, are you there? Simi, your voice is not coming. Not audible, Simi. Am I audible now? Yes, now audible, please. Okay, great. Thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. Uh, this, uh, this was really, really enlightening. Uh, may I now request uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Nivedita Haran to provide her remarks following which we can have Professor Kelkar's responses. Okay, uh, I'll not take much time. I want to uh, say that uh, listening to Professor Kelkar, I realized that probably a um, lot of things I would have wanted to say, she has said it in a much more, uh, much more uh, cogent manner. Uh, but I'd like to probably supplement some of these with a few examples from real life. Uh, when we talk about uh, accelerating inclusive equality, we are talking about uh, people who will be doing it. And the people who are doing it are people like you and me who are coming from the same society. And therefore, we have to make sure that uh, we accept that they are coming up with the same kind of upbringing, the conditioning that uh, all of us are brought up with, uh, brought up in, uh, the education system that we are all part of, including higher education, where uh, often uh, they are not probably imbibing the right kind of values. Uh, and more so these days when they're open to the social media where all kinds of information they are being bombarded with. Now, what do you do in this kind of a situation? Uh, at the same time, we must make sure that our policies and uh, the administration is sensitive, takes care of the requirements that are necessary for a, for a uh, very rational equity between genders, different groups, different classes and, and uh, people. How do you do it? Um, Professor Kelker gave some very good examples of uh, joint land titling. I want to draw your attention to the FRA, the Forest Rights Act, which uh, says that every ROR to be issued will be in the joint, joint name of the wife and the husband. Uh, the act says that, however, uh, how many states have done it? And who has asked questions? Have any of you asked questions to them? I do not know. Because I remember when, uh, in the guise of doing this, I had also circulated a, a draft policy for doing the same thing for assignment of all government lands. You know, government uh, under the Land Assignment Act in most states, government assigns land to the uh, vulnerable and the economically weaker sections, small extents of land. And uh, we have proposed that let us give that in the joint name, in the joint title of the, the wife and the husband. Uh, and the question at that time was why? Why now? Let us be done with this FRA Act. That itself is enough for the present. Now, uh, again, somebody, Professor Kelker and somebody else asked the question that uh, who are doing it? It is us who are doing it. And how many women are involved in it? I think that is something that is really, really worth looking into. Uh, are, why are there no women patwaris? And are there revenue secretaries who are women? There are states, believe me, who until now believe that women officers are not to be posted as revenue secretaries and home secretaries. And who is asking questions? Are any of you doing that? I think that's something that needs to be taken note of. The second example I want to give is that the involvement of the people who are really, really the uh, at the cutting edge. So the, the stakeholders. I remember a case in Eastern Europe when I was uh, on deputation to the United Nations where uh, the European Union had sanctioned the construction of a, of a very fancy community hall for that municipality. And the women of that municipality came to me and said that we don't need that now. We need drinking water. Every winter the pipes burst and we are left to have no water. We melt ice to get water for our children, uh, even to give them portable water. That is the kind of water we have to deal with, uh, we have to do with. 
So why do we need a community hall? We need uh, 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 drinking water for our kids. So uh, the question I ask them is that who, who gave the suggestion that there should be a community hall? And the answer was nobody consulted us. So you see, it's not just in India, it's all over. We have to make sure that women's voices are heard. The LA Act, if you remember the LA Act and with the rehabilitation uh, component that has now come in, uh, requires that jobs should be given to the hosties, to the parties who are losing land. Now, why is it limited to jobs in factories alone? There are so many other jobs that are going to be created. And, however, in the guidelines, it says jobs in the factories. I think that is the kind of uh, lack of sensitivity that is there. And I do not say that this is done willfully. This is often done because uh, probably due to ignorance. I also remember the case in Kerala. And again, Professor Kelkar was uh, mentioning it and it reminded me of uh, giving land rights, joint rights to SAGs. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware in Kerala, in uh, the, the Kudumbushri groups are bringing about a very silent revolution where they are taking up agriculture, agriculture work. Women consisting of 10 to six to 10 people are forming SAGs and taking up lands on lease for doing agriculture, for cultivating cash crops, banana crops, even paddy cultivation. Now, one problem we found is that the moment the land, uh, the crop was ready for being harvested, the owner would come back and say he wants the land back. And the, the agreement was just a white paper agreement. And therefore the women had no, uh, no power to deny it. And what do they do? So one such came to my notice, to our notice, I was revenue land revenue commissioner at that time. And we found that under the Land Reforms Act of 1970, leasing of agriculture land is banned in Kerala. And therefore, even if these women want it, they cannot take the land on a regular lease, a legal lease. And therefore, this is the situation. We tried our level best to get something into the act, into the rules so that we could change it. And these women's uh, cultivating the land could be legalized, but we could not. And I remember a case, and I have to mention this case, where uh, a group of 10 women came from Kasargod and said that their banana crop, after nine, 10 months of taking care of, is now ready for harvesting. The two men who own the land, 10 acres of land, have come back, come back from Dubai and are saying they want their land back next week. What do we do? We need just a month to get the crop harvested. I moved heaven and earth, week I could not do anything until we did something which was probably not legal. I told the collector to keep his, uh, keep the petition from the man who has said that give me back my, help me get back my land. Just keep it under the carpet, keep it under your papers. We are very good at doing that. And then let's see what happens. He did that. The collector was an understanding person and these women could harvest their crops and go back. Now, this is the kind of problem that arises on in the field. Why do we not do research and papers on such subjects? I think what we need is to bridge the gap between what is happening, the lab research, the, the, the academic research, some very good ones that happen, and what is actually happening in the field. Bridge the gap between the academicians and the administrators. That, unless that happens, our policies will always remain something on paper which will not be implemented. The other point that Professor Kelkar mentioned is extremely correct and extremely important. We have wonderful policies, but those policies are never executed or implemented. What is the use of having such policies? And these policies have come because somebody has thought about it, but never thought about how to go about to implement it. The other gap that also exists is between the state and the non-state actors. Uh, I do not see why that difference should be there provided all of us are thinking about the welfare of the people. I, I, I really cannot understand why such a, such a gap should remain. And finally, the, the, the gap that remains and that arises often arises between what is happening on the ground and what should be happening on the ground. I think unless these gaps are bridged, I don't think we can take our policies forward. And that's where the problem is. I want to end by mentioning that this morning I was with a group of women, uh, migrant laborers. I was interacting with them who have gone from different parts of Bengal, Bihar to Kerala, and they are working there. They're women migrants. And they were mentioning their problems. 
first and foremost, nobody even considers them to be migrant labor because for them, migrant, for the state and for the others, the migrant labor are only men. Women don't go there. Second, the kind of problems they raise is never considered. They cannot go to a doctor because the doctor speaks only Malayalam and these are women who speak Hindi or Bengali. How do they approach a doctor? You see, this kind, these kinds of problems will come to, the, come to focus only when we know what the ground situation is. And therefore, I think an, an, an establishment and an organization like IMPRI should take up the role of bridging these gaps. I think that is what is important if we really want to take our country forward. Thank you. Thanks, Simi. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, certainly, this uh, your words really add uh, immense uh, importance. And uh, we'd, uh, we'd really uh, love to take up the kind of work that you have uh, just suggested uh, to add value to the real policy making and implementation process. Thank you so much. So without for, uh, wasting any further time, um, I would now invite Professor Kelkar to respond to all the discussants' remarks. And also, if you've been able to take note of a few questions, else uh, I can help you with the questions as well. Over to you, ma'am. Um, I think it is 8.30. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> How long we can go on? Right. So the question of, I would be very, very brief in terms of the discussant remarks, general. I am, uh, I am overwhelmed with your suggestions, but uh, I don't have any words to adequately appreciate the chair, hmm? the fair, uh, chairperson. I, I wanted only one request to her that we can keep in touch with her and probably learn more from about Kerala experience. We do hear about it. We have studied Kutum. She also visited Kerala, but we really want <coughs> more and more inputs from that. So that would be your kind of uh, guidance would be important. About a uh, couple of things that I wanted to address. One is that I, I don't think women are homogeneous categories. I was not talking. I made the initial one thing, I am talking of a small landholders women in rural areas. That was my initial remark that was did, uh, probably discussed. So I do see, I work, all my years, probably on indigenous women's area, the land rights for women in Jharkhand, where I started the kind of thing, and how many women are killed as witches in the name because of the land rights. Now, so even their kind of those, those experiences also are, uh, are their kind of thing, Chhatis girl, all the kind of, um, uh, I've been just completed the book and, and did another study. So land is very, very critically important. So I was not lumping all the women together. That is not really the, has been the part. Uh, I, um, and the other area was about structural embeddedness of the discrimination. Sure, I'm saying that all the economic institutions, uh, when I said the topmost institutions of World Bank and IMF, they all kind of social kind of thing, even in SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, according to the national laws. When they can't deal that this is the kind of thing given according to the national laws. And what is the national law, national situation? That means <coughs> sensitivity to social norms what the government promotes. So that would be the uh, one thing that I will say. Yes, women's invisibility in migration studies is very, very important. We have been taking of my, uh, talking of migration, I mean, those who have been studying, but seeing only as the, like women, uh, like farmers, we talk, uh, the male face comes when we see the migrant, with the exception of domestic workers, all migrants are seen as the only men. So there is a need for this kind of analysis with uh, uh, Dr. Nivetita pointed out about the, how the women from Bihar and other parts have gone. So that it would be very important. Uh, struggle is the key, as the Francis Raj said. And of course, um, um, today I saw a fantastic video. And uh, in fact, there is no time, otherwise I put them. For somebody had forwarded from Pakistan. in club. And then you see women and men participating in this struggle in Pakistan. Huh? that moving a kind of procession. And then the whole song is there, that how the kind of um, uh, we will break that uh, roof under which the katil, katil is the murderer lives kind of there. So honor killings and others are uh, kind of uh, referred to. So these are the these are the expressions of women's agency. Sometimes they go 
beyond this kind of thing but every moment is has these high and lows kind of thing every moment has some kind of excesses and that's how i tend to look at that access to commons is a good kind of point i appreciate not only commons but in communities also i when the i have seen so much kind of when the community is consulted and women are left out because community consists of only men and how much <coughs> commons is going getting privatized so i am familiar with the meghalaya case but in this kind of short time i was i appreciate your comments i was able to cover probably uh, this kind of uh, uh, the structure of the presentation that i was able to do so your comments are very very welcome including soma has raised about access to commons soma parthasathi yes i agree soma about this i am not in favor of joint titling huh? because i really believe that um, uh, the whenever the government realize that joint titles have not worked reason is that if you have the alliance between a brahman and dalit that alliance is not going to work okay between the powerful and less powerful or powerless not even less powerful between powerful and powerless so joint titling is really like that i think women need unmediated right to land that is unmediated right in forest resources joint titles are not going to work because of the all powerful male structures so that is the reason i am not saying that families uh, should not kind of uh, there should not be any harmony in the family in fact there will be more harmony in the family if we have the kind of independent titles of the land because nobody would really try to control another person who is powerless or domestic violence would reduce or but can nullified if we have the joint uh, if we have these unmediated rights to land and other property so that is one thing that i feel strongly about this and um, uh, that is also i appreciate your comments very much because it also shows me that where i should highlight and where i should uh, kind of uh, where were the gaps in the presentation so i very very much highly highly appreciate your inputs thank you very much uh if you can give me the comments on that then i can uh, or questions then i can uh, really look at the i did try at the look at the some kind of in the chat came and but i was not able to pay attention because i wanted to pay attention to the the discussion that was being done <laughs> thank you so much ma'am ma'am uh, because we are quite uh, we have uh, quite uh, out of time so uh, in the interest of time i think uh, if it is okay with you we i will just uh, email the questions and you could respond uh, if that is fine because you have touched almost all the questions uh, so quickly if i can uh, uh, that would be that would be wonderful i feel okay. like a kind of thing that i would certainly do that thank you ma'am so quickly if i can uh, take the liberty to invite all the discussants with uh, um, 30 seconds to 1 minute each of their uh, what they understand as the way forward towards inclusive equality their concluding lines or uh, statements that would be really great so may i start with uh, professor indu well i think uh, a lot has been said there's really no need i'll just emphasize one point which uh, dr francis raj also raised in the women's movement we also always emphasize the need for alliance building and i think for women to uh, gain access and uh, actual sort of strength in terms of power and decision making they really need to invest in this because women are not just a gender based category women have other identities play other roles and it is only through uh, uh, building alliances and links with wider democratic movements for change and for democratic change i think that the uh, movement for rights for women can go forward Uh, i will just emphasize that i think that's the history of march 8 that's the history of international women's day and of struggles for women's rights and i think the women's movement has always cherished that and tried to build on that i would end with that thank you surely thank you so much ma'am uh, dr francis over to you yes. dr francis yes Uh, yeah i think uh, dr in uh, professor indu has summed up what actually i wanted to say but then uh, 
uh, this platform, such discussions, lively discussions uh, on policy and on the community, they also play a very important role. You know? That is how the struggles are also built. Thank you. Dr. Manohar Mabakshi, over to you. Um, Ma'am, if you could unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Uh, no, I can't, can't hear you. Is it okay, Simina? Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I would like, number one, uh, I would like to have specific targets for women employment, uh, industry targets, right? rather industry specific targets. Number second, I would definitely like like women, maybe 50% membership of women farmers in the farmer produce organizations, FPOs. Number third, I would like to have like ASHAs and ANMs especially ANA, these ASHAs and, uh, you know, Anganwadi workers to have normal wages to so that we can raise this to government so that they can have at least like more than 18,000 rupees they can earn. So that these are these are my three takes. Yeah. Thanks. Very important. Thank you, ma'am. 18,000 rupees is quite a... Um, thank you so much. Dr. Uh, Sri Devi, over to you. Um, we have women who have played effectively certain leadership roles at the national level. But I, I strongly believe that promoting the women in grassroots governance, especially the strategies that work for the equality of the women is very, very important. And second, uh, whenever we make certain policies, it should be in the rights perspective rather than just making the policy and uh, trying to pick a few women and uh, provide the facilities. So the human rights approach and equality is essential for the women. That's what I believe. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Professor Kelkar, would you like to add something if you would I, want? I agree with uh, everything. And uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, uh, um, Manorama's point, uh, Dr. Manorama's point, that ASHA workers and AN workers, I mean, how they have been working and how they have not been paid or marginally paid, 18,000 the minimum and the government of India doesn't like the funds. I mean, we don't want so many fighters and jets and other things. We want people to live with dignity and that is really the human rights kind of thing that is important. So that, that is definitely a kind of point that need to be pointed out. These are the women who are the, who are the real workers, who are the frontline workers. And frontline workers doesn't mean only health. They are really the a kind of information on the rural society they have, what things are working, what policies are not working. And they certainly need to be treated with kind of tremendous dignity. And other points I, I definitely appreciate from uh, all of you. Dr. Nilay, uh, yes. Can, can I just add a point? Um, so engendering of data, Anna, that is a, I think that is a very uh, crucial step and the first important step uh, towards uh, uh, the uh, uh, any justice that can be done in the society. Um, unless we do the general segregation, we understand, we know where women stand and where are the gaps. We cannot really actually argue for a better case. You know? So engendering of data and um, uh, including more data variables related to women, I think that is one crucial thing also. Dr. Francis Raz, you are kind of asking the state to expose itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I mean, somebody has to do that. <laughs> yes. Right. We all have to get the data. That's right. Dr. Nivedita, your concluding words. Uh, yeah. Uh, just on that point, uh, desegregated data, Professor Kelkar and Dr. Francis is available of uh, land titles in the name of uh, women or men. And especially now with the land records computerized, it's definitely available. And I can also say that the uh, Department of RD, DOLR, collects this data every quarter from all the state governments. So I don't see, they have no business to say they don't have the data. No. I do not know. Dr. Nivedita, they are still in the process because I think this started when the, that's what I learned from the uh, ministry here, that they are in the process in order to report on the SDGs. 
that what land women have and what they don't have kind of. Uh, some of the states have actually digitalized the records. Like Telangana, it is available online. Yeah. Kerala has it, I know. Yeah. 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 Southern so, states really have. 97, 99% they have recorded yeah. almost. Uh, my one, one sentence takeaway would be that let us uh, educate and empower our children female and male, in a manner that they grow up to have the right values and they understand that all we need is equality and equity between everyone. I think that kind of upbringing, if we can bring about, we'll have the right kind of administrators, the right kind of policy makers and the right kind of researchers and academicians also. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I invite Dr. Arjun Kumar to now uh, deliver the formal vote of thanks. So, uh, thank you so much, Simi, for moderating the session. And I thank all of you uh, to participate uh, in this very <coughs> extremely pertinent and this enriching session. And uh, uh, it was beyond the rhetoric and in all this solidarity. So, thank you, everyone, for joining on this International uh, Women Day. Uh, to this distinguished lecture, uh, the role of policy in society in accelerating inclusive inequality, uh, choose to challenge for actions and impact by uh, Professor Govind Kelkar, ma'am, and chaired by uh, Professor Nirita Hiranan. Thank you so much uh, uh, for this deliberation and our discussions, uh, Professor Virginius Khaka, uh, Professor Indu Agnihotri, uh, Sri Devi, ma'am, uh, Dr. Manurma Bakshi, and Dr. Francis Rasser. Thank you, all of you, and to Anshula Simi and all the entry team. And uh, all the all those who have been patient to uh, hear to all all this very important conversation, and those who will be watching it later. So it's very uh, late also. So wish you a very uh, uh, good evening and good night. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy so International Women's Day once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.